Preface and Introduction to the Letters of a Portuguese Nun. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Letters of a Portuguese Nun by Mariana Coforado. Translated by Edgar Prestage. Preface. My attempt at an English rendering of the letters is, I think, the first, since the days of Ball's Letters from a Portuguese Nun to an Officer in the French Army, London, 1808. Footnote. An American translation was published in 1890. End of footnote. But during the two centuries which have elapsed since their first publication, quite a small literature has grown up around them, and they have been turned into several European tongues, the French editions alone amounting to more than thirty. If the numerous so-called replies and imitations were added to this reckoning, the number would be nearly doubled, and this without taking into account the critiques and studies which have appeared about them. I do not propose here to enter into a comparison of the letters with those of Heloise, as many writers have done, but shall content myself with referring the curious to the excellent work of Sr. Cordeiro, Soror Mariana, a Freira Portuguesa, Lisbon, 1888, second edition, 1891. It is from him that I have learned nearly all that I know about Mariana, and in my introduction I have made a liberal use of his book, as well as of Monsieur Asse's preface to the edition of the Lettre Portugaise avec les Réponses, Paris, 1889, upon which I have based my rendering. If my translation should arouse any interest in things Portuguese, and lead others to read and make versions of such masterpieces of the world's literature as the Frei Luís de Souza and the Folhas Caídas of Garrete, or the poems of João de Deus, I should be more than rewarded for any trouble the present work may have cost me. But who can hope to succeed where Burton has apparently failed? The English public, and the critics too, will probably continue to believe that there is nothing worth reading in Portuguese literature with the exception of the Lusiads. Here, too, there is perhaps a lesson to be learned from the Germans, especially from such as Storch, Reinhard Stittner, and Michaelis de Vasconcelos. I should like to thank Mr. York Powell of Christ Church for the kind help which he has given me in the difficult task of translation. My aim has been throughout to keep as close to the French text as possible, seeing that the original Portuguese is lost, aided by the masterly retranslation of Senhor Cordeiro. L'Etrange's version, Five Love Letters from a Nun to a Cavalier, London, 1678, is somewhat free at times, but it has aided me in the third letter. I have followed Cordeiro in his rearrangement of the order of the letters, the second and fourth changing places. The historical facts which concern the hero and heroine of these letters I have given briefly in the introduction, and a bibliography and appendix will be found at the end of the volume. The text of the first French edition of 1669 has been copied in Paris purposely for this work, and will, it is hoped, add much to its interest and value. And so I deliver poor Mariana's passionate epistles to the consideration of those who can appreciate them and feel for her. And weeping then she made her moan, The night comes on that knows no morn, When I shall cease to be alone, to live forgotten and love forlorn. Edgar Prestige, Bowdoin, 1892 Introduction Fui los deleites, pues non da deleite perfecto, nin bueno, nin tan poco sano, a todos engaña su falso afeite, sin sentir mata el su gozo vano, a todos ariendan del bien soberano, jamás no aplacen que no den tristeza, a forjan cadenas del sotil volcano, con que encarcelan a toda nobleza. Cancioneiro de Rezende. In 1663, says Saint Beuve, it became the policy of Louis the Fourteenth to help Portugal against Spain, but the succor which he gave was indirect. Subsidies were secretly furnished, the levying of troops was favored, and a crowd of volunteers hastened there. Between this small army, commanded by Schomburg, and the feeble Spanish troops which disputed the soil with it, 
there were each summer many marches and counter-marches, with but few results, many skirmishes and small fights, and among the latter perhaps one victory. Who troubles himself about it now? The curious reader, however, who only looks to his own pleasure, cannot help saying that all this was good, since the letters of the Portuguese nun grew from it. As St. Beuve indicates, the subject of the letters forms one of the episodes of the war between Spain and Portugal, which followed as a consequence of the restoration of 1640 and the achievement of the latter's independence under the house of Braganza. This war, which lasted for twenty-eight years until the final peace in 1668, was intermittent and carried on only at long intervals owing to the state of the two contending parties. Spain had now entered on the period of her decline, and Portugal was in a hardly better condition after her sixty years' captivity and the exhaustion of her forces which had taken place during the reign of Philip the Fourth. Owing, however, to the aid of France, she had been enabled to hold her own up to 1659. But the news of the peace of the Pyrenees seemed at first to take from her all hope of preserving her hardly won autonomy. Yet, in spite of this, Mazarin, while signing the clause which bound France to abandon the Portuguese cause, determined, with his usual duplicity, that this should not prevent him from secretly aiding an ally whom he had found so useful in the past as a thorn in the side of Spain. Hardly, indeed, had the treaty been made then he began to occupy himself in recruiting for the Portuguese service a number of French officers whom the peace had left without employment. Among these, the chief was Schomburg, who went to Lisbon in 1660 as commander-in-chief and to reorganize the Portuguese army. It was not, however, until 1663 that the hero of the letters, Noel Bouton, afterwards Marquis of Chamilly and saint Leger arrived in the country, which he was to leave four years later, with the betrayal of a poor nun as his title to fame. For at the time when Schomburg was already there, we see Chamilly, as he is generally called, assisting at the marriage of his brother to Catherine Le Conte de Nonin, referred to in the text, letter two. Three years afterwards, finding himself without military employment in France, he came to Portugal, attracted probably, like so many others, by the reputation of the great captain, with whom he had doubtless established friendly relations during the campaign in Flanders, 1656-58. to Our hero, if hero he may be called, was the eleventh son of Nicolas Bouton, lord of Chamilly, Charangeroux, and later on saint Leger, properties of modest size in Burgundy. His family was good, but its attachment to the princes of Condé during the Fronde had compromised its position and damaged its fortunes. Noel, the future Marquis, was born in 1636, and as soon as his age allowed, he entered on a military career. He served through the Flanders campaign under Touraine, and in 1658 was made captain under the name of the Count of Chamilly in Mazarin's regiment of cavalry. Reaching Portugal at the end of 1663, or the commencement of 1664, he was given the same rank in a regiment commanded by a French officer of note, Priquemot. Although his name is not mentioned in any of the contemporary notices of the war, we know that he was present at the siege of Valença de Alcântara, June 1664, at the Battle of Castelo Rodrigo, in the same month and year, at that of Montes Claros, June 1665, and at the principal sieges which occupy the next two years. In 1665 he was promoted to the rank of colonel, and two years later a diploma of Louis XIV, issued perhaps at the instance of his brother, the governor of Dijon, gave Chamilly a similar post in the French army, with the evident intention of enabling him to leave the Portuguese service when he liked, even though the war with Spain should not be ended. This, taken together with the fact that in the document the space for the month is left blank, is extremely significant, and, as will be seen later on, certainly connects itself with the episode of the letters, even if it does not enter into their actual history. 
The diploma of Louis XIV, it may be added, is dated 1667, and the sudden departure of Chamilly took place at the end of that year, so that it seems probable that the French captain, fearing future annoyance or even danger to himself from his liaison, had determined to secure a safe retreat. But let us look for a moment at the authoress of the famous Portuguese letters. Mariana Alcoforado was born of a good family in the city of Beja, and province of Alentejo, in the year 1640. Her father appears to us in the first years of the Restoration as a man in an influential position, well related, and discharging important commissions both administrative and political. He possessed a large agricultural property, which he administered with attention and even zeal, and was a cavalier of the Order of Christ, besides being intimate with some of the principal men of the time. He had six children, of whom Mariana, according to Cordeiro, was the second. Life in Beja at that time seems to have been sufficiently insecure, owing to the fact that the province of which it was one of the chief cities formed the theatre of the war, and Beja itself was the chief garrison town. Tumults were constantly arising from quarrels between the various parts of the heterogeneous mass which then composed the Portuguese army, and hence increased care would be necessary on the part of Francisco Alcoforado in order that the education of his daughters might be conducted in such a manner as their position demanded. Hence, too, probably, the reason why Mariana and her sister Catherine entered the convent of the Conception at an earlier age than was usual. Their father, occupied with administrative and military work on the frontier, would be unable to give them the oversight and attention which quieter times would have allowed. The convent of the Conception at Beja was founded in 1467 by the parents of King Emmanuel the Fortunate, and favored successively by royal and private devotion, it had become one of the most important and wealthy institutions of its kind in Portugal. It was situated at the extreme south of the city, near to the ancient walls, and looked on to the gate still called of Mertola, because they are on the side of the city towards Mertola, distant fifty-four kilometers to the southwest on the right bank of the Guadiana. There is still to be seen the remains of the balcony or veranda from which Mariana first caught sight of Chamilly, probably during some military evolutions, confer letter two, and from it a good view may be obtained over the plains of Alentejo, as they stretch away to the south. Curiously enough, the tradition of Mariana and her fatal love has been perpetuated in the convent, in spite of the attempts, natural enough, on the part of monastic chroniclers and such like to hide all traces of it. In this, as in most other convents, there were two kinds of cells, the dormitories divided into cubicles, and rooms forming independent abodes, dispersed throughout the edifice. These latter the nuns of the seventeenth century called their houses, as suas casas, and it was one of these which Mariana possessed. The former were in accordance with the constitutions, while the latter, though strictly forbidden, nevertheless existed. These separate abodes were, it is true, often necessitated by the growth of the convent population, and generally appertained to nuns of a better position, while the dormitories served for those who were either poorer or of an inferior rank. Many of these casas, too, were built by private individuals, who had some connection or other with the particular convent, and there are indications that the father of Mariana had caused some to be erected in that of the Conception. From the year 1665 to 1667, then, Beja was, as we have said, the center of the various military movements in which Chamilly took part under the leadership of Schomburg, and there is no doubt that he spent much of his time there. Mariana was twenty-five years old. She had been entrusted to the cloister when a child, as she herself tells us, and her renunciation of the world must have been little more than a form. She had probably made her profession, too, at the age of sixteen, that provided for by the constitutions, if not at an earlier date. The dull routine of her life was suddenly broken in upon by the sight of a man, 
surrounded with all the prestige of military glory, one who was the first to awaken in her a consciousness of her own beauty, the first to tell her that he loved her, one, moreover, who was ready to throw all his greatness, his present and his future, at her feet. I was young, I was trustful, I had been shut up in this convent since my childhood, I had only seen people whom I did not care for. I had never heard the praises which you constantly gave me. Methought I owed you the charms and the beauty which you found in me, and which you were the first to make me perceive. I heard you well talked of. Everyone spoke in your favor. You did all that was necessary to awaken love in me. Footnote. Letter 5. End of footnote. Such is her simple confession, and comments Cordeiro, nothing more natural. Their first meeting was probably due to the relations which Chamilly, an officer of rank, had entered into with the Alcoforados, one of the chief families in Beja. There are indications, indeed, that Chamilly and Mariana's eldest brother had met, doubtless in the field, for the latter also followed the profession of arms, and this brother, named Baltazar Vaz Alcoforado, is probably the same as the brother referred to in the letters as the lovers go between. It was for his benefit that Mariana's father had striven for years to build up an estate which was to be entailed on his offspring. But in the year 1669, just at the very time of the great sensation caused by the publication of the letters in Paris, Balthazar abandoned his military career and all his brilliant prospects in the world to enter the priesthood. It is impossible not to hazard a guess, although we know nothing for certain on the point, that his motive for so doing was connected in some way with the almost tragic ending of the liaison between his sister and the French captain. But to return, the customs of the time, curiously enough, allowed a greater relative liberty to nuns as regards the visits which might be paid them than to married women or, as the bishop of Grampara puts it, the liberty of the grating was wide in those miserable times. We cannot, of course, be expected to give an account of the progress of this liaison, nor do we wish to indulge in romantic hypotheses. Chamilly was thirty at the time when he first saw Mariana. Brought up as he had been to war as a trade, a man of small intelligence and few scruples, the intrigue would be a pleasant diversion, a means pour passer le temps, which he would otherwise have found dull enough in a Portuguese provincial town after the Paris of Le Grand Monarque. The seduction and desertion of a poor nun must have seemed all so perfectly natural to one brought up in contact with the loose morality of camp life and in the France of Louis XIV. In June 1667, the authorities of Beja received an answer from the new king, Dom Pedro, to the complaint which they had made of the oppression which the French cavalry continued to exercise on this people. Already, on account of similar complaints, Schomburg had been ordered to move his cavalry from the town and district, but he had disobeyed these orders for strategic reasons. Now, we have already seen that it was between 1665 and 1667 that Chamilly carried on his intrigue with Mariana, and it is just in 1667 that the scandal must have attained greater proportions, coinciding with an ending, not in the withdrawal of the French cavalry, but in the sudden retirement of Chamilly to France. But what, it may be asked, was the reason for the king's order, and what could those oppressions have been in an important city, where presumably there was a regular and well-appointed police administration? Has it not a relation, asks Cordeiro, with the incident in the letters, which would both afflict and irritate the influential family of the nun and the good burgesses of Beja? The special situation of the French captain, on the other hand, his interest in not aggravating the scandal and the peril for the religious herself in the adoption of violent means, would all naturally counsel the withdrawal of Chamilly. The danger of remaining longer in Beja was not in the nature of those which the French colonel could confront with his recognized courage. 
if he were surprised in the convent, if he were denounced as its violator and as the seducer of a nun, the daughter of a well-known family, and one, too, which was on excellent terms with the new sovereign, neither his own position nor the protection of Schomberg would avail him, since both the one and the other began to lose their importance with the approach of peace. However this may be, certain it is that Chamilly's own excuses for departure referred to in the letters were merely empty pretexts, and a reference to the history of the time will show this. If Louis XIV needed his presence so much for the invasion of Franche Comte, why not, it may be asked, for the important campaign in Flanders in 1667? He seems to have left Portugal, too, a little clandestinely, for no notice is to be met with, as in the case of other French officers, of his asking and obtaining leave from the Portuguese government, and he probably did not even embark in Lisbon. Already in the beginning of February 1668, we find him with Louis XIV in Dijon, so that he must have quitted Beja in the seat of war quite at the end of the preceding year. It is now that the letters enter into the history of the lives of Mariana and Noel Bouton de Chamilly. As is well known, they were all written after the latter's retirement from Portugal, and probably between the December of 1667 and the June of 1668, and they express better than any remarks which we could make the stages of faith, doubt, and despair through which poor Mariana passed. As a piece of unconscious, though self-made, psychological analysis, they are unsurpassed. As a product of the peninsular heart, they are unrivaled. If they are not, as Teófilo Braga calls them, the only beautiful work produced by his countrymen in the seventeenth century, they are, at any rate, by far the most beautiful. To compare them as regards literary form with those of Heloise would be manifestly unfair. The situation of the two women was so different. Footnote. For a good comparison of the letters of Mariana and Heloise, see an article entitled La Eloisa Portuguesa in the June number of the review España Moderna, 1889, written by Emilia Pardo Bassan. End of footnote. Think of the abbess of the Paraclete, mistress of all the learning of the time, and surrounded by things to console her, or at least to divert her attention, and then regard poor Mariana, persecuted by her family, and liable to the tender mercies of the Inquisition, with none of the comforts, none of the consolations of the former. But if the letters of Heloise are superior to those of Mariana, from the point of view of correctness of expression and style, they are inferior in all else. The nuns are far more natural, and therefore more beautiful, and the very confusion of feelings and ideas which we should expect from one in her position rather adds to their charm. Finally, the moral character of Heloise, as displayed in her epistles, cannot certainly be placed beside that of the Portuguese nun with any advantage. Henceforth, we only meet with the name of Mariana at intervals, once in 1668, again in 1676, and 1709, and lastly in an obituary notice in 1723. She, at any rate, is not an example of the well-known saying of Cervantes, the Portuguese die of love. It is true that some words at the end of the fifth letter seem to suggest suicide, but there is, on the other hand, throughout the whole of these ultima verba, an expression of energy and of her determination to tread underfoot, if she cannot extinguish the flames of her passion. Mariana came of a vigorous race, and in spite of the great infirmities of which her obituary speaks, she lived, as we shall see, to the age of fourscore years and three. She was made portress, as mentioned in the letters at the beginning of 1668, no doubt to distract her mind by giving her some definite occupation and a sense of responsibility. It is, however, significant, as Cordeiro remarks, that we do not find the name of Mariana, a daughter of one of the principal and most influential families in Beja, filling any more elevated post, whereas her younger sister, Peregrina Maria, appears in the conventual register as both a Manuensis and abbess. 
This sister, before professing in the same convent in 1676, made her will, being more than twelve years of age, and there she spoke of the many obligations which she owed Mariana for having brought her up from the age of three years. Her entering the conception at such an early age is explained by the fact of the death of her mother, which took place at the end of 1663 or the beginning of 1664. Again, in 1709, Mariana is mentioned as beaten by only ten votes in an election for the office of abbess, by a certain nun, of the name of Joana de Bouillon, of whom nothing is known. The next time we hear of her is in 1723, the date of her death. The obituary notice speaks for itself, and for her life, since the episode which the letters contain, and needs no comment. On the twenty-eighth day of the month of July, in the year 1723, died, in this royal convent of Our Lady of the Conception, Mother Dona Mariana Alconforada, at the age of eighty-seven years, all of which she spent in the service of God. She was always very regular in the choir and at the confraternities, and withal fulfilled her other obligations. She was very exemplary, and none had fault to find with her, for she was very kind to all. For thirty years she did rigid penance, and suffered great infirmities, with much conformity, desiring to have more to suffer. When she knew that her last hour was come, she asked for all the sacraments, which she received in a state of perfect consciousness, giving many thanks to God for having received them. Thus she ended her life with all the signs of predestination, speaking up to the last hour, in proof of which I, Dona Anya Sofia Batista de Almeida, amanuensis of the convent, wrote this, which I signed on the same day, month and year, as above. Dona Ana Sofia Batista de Almeida, amanuensis. No such obscurity as that which hangs over the life of Mariana hides the doings of Chamilly after his return to France. Acts like the famous defense of Grave in 1674 against the Prince of Orange and that of Oudenarde two years later marked him out for future distinction. But if he knew how to defend towns, he no less could attack and take them. He distinguished himself greatly at the sieges of Gand, Condé, Ypres, and Heidelberg, and in 1703 received the recompense of his great services, being made a marshal of France. M. Asse tells several anecdotes about him, which seem to show that he was a generous man as well as a brave soldier. United in 1671 by a mariage de convenance to a lady who, according to S. Simon, was far from being gifted with personal beauty, he was always a most exemplary husband. S. Simon, who knew him well, also tells us that Chamilly was the best man in the world, the bravest and the most honorable. He says, too, that no one, after seeing him or hearing him speak, could understand how he had inspired such an unmeasured love as that revealed in the famous letters. How then are we to reconcile the Chamilly of the letters with the men of whom his contemporaries and friends speak so highly? The publication of the epistles of Mariana was doubtless due to vanity, a fault which we may certainly credit Chamilly with possessing. It was, too, the custom in seventeenth-century France to hand round copies of letters, either received or written, for the admiration of France, and thus what now appears to us a brutal and cynical want of confidence was then the most natural thing in the world. It is not, however, so easy, even if it is possible, to excuse the conduct of the French captain in the betrayal and desertion of poor Mariana. Posterity, as M. Asse says, especially the feminine portion, has condemned him, and there seems to be no reason why we should seek to reverse the verdict. It was in 1669 that the first edition of what we know as the Portuguese Letters was published by Claude Barbin, the well-known Parisian bookseller. The translation seems to have been made towards the middle of the year preceding, and shortly after the return of Chamilly to France. The letters were evidently shown by their possessor as one of those trophies, or at least souvenirs, which persons are accustomed to bring back with them from a foreign country. The incognito, however, was complete, 
and neither the name of the recipient nor that of their translator was inscribed on this editio princeps. That of Mariana, indeed, the authoress, was not known until early in this present century, when, in 1810, Boissonade discovered her name, written in a copy of the edition of 1669 by a contemporary hand. The veracity of this note has since been placed beyond doubt by the recent researches of Senhor Cordeiro, who has shown the persistence of a tradition in Beja connecting the French captain and the Portuguese nun. The success of the first edition was rapid and complete. A second by Barbin, and two in foreign countries, one in Amsterdam, the other in Cologne, all in the same year, attest this. The success, indeed, took such proportions that from the mutual rivalry of authors and publishers there sprung up a new kind of literature, that of Le Portuguese. The five letters of the nun had followers like most successful romances, and the title of Portuguese letters became a generic name, applying not only to the imitations which amplified subsequent editions, but also to every kind of correspondence where passion was shown tout nu. Brancas, says Madame de Sévigné, has written me a letter so excessively tender as to make up for all his past neglect. He speaks to me from his heart in every line. If I were to reply to him in the same tone, c'est ce roi in Portuguese. In the same year, 1669, Barba issued a second part of the Portuguese letters, which was counterfeited shortly afterwards at Cologne, as the real ones had been. This was written, we are told in the preface, by a femme du monde, and its publication was suggested by the favor with which the letters of the nun had been received. The publisher counted, as he said, on the difference of style which distinguished these fresh letters from the original ones to assure a success as great as the first five had obtained. After the second part came the so-called replies, all in the same year, and their publisher tells us in the preface that he is assured that the gentleman who wrote them has returned to Portugal. Shortly afterwards appeared the new replies, but this time they were given for what they were, a jeu d'esprit, for which the example of Aulus Salinas, writing replies to the heroides of Ovid, and above all, the beauty of the first Portuguese letters, should serve as an excuse. The motive, then, for the production of the second part of the Portuguese letters, as for that of the new replies, is satisfactorily explained. But how about the replies themselves? Can we not account for them by supposing that it was felt necessary, on the part of the friend of Chamilly, to attenuate the sympathy expressed on all sides for the unfortunate nun, and the censure which must naturally have followed, such a base betrayal? Hence, proceeds Sr. Cordeiro, the author of this suggestion, the publication of these replies, whose capital idea is to show us the seducer of Mariana under a perfectly different aspect and character from that which readers of the letters would naturally attribute to him. However this may be, it was not long before the name of their hero came to be printed in editions of the letters, though, curiously enough, it was first divulged in an edition printed abroad, in Cologne, in 1669, a copy of which is to be found in the British Museum, marked 1085 B period 5 2 in parenthesis, containing the following. The name of him to whom they, the letters, were written is the Chevalier de Chamilly, and the name of him who made the translation is Cuillerac. More strange still, the French editions of the letters preserved a discreet silence as to the name of the recipient, with the exception of the 1671 edition of the replies, until the year 1690, when a similar notice to that above referred to, as being in the Cologne edition, was made public, so that even in Chamilly's lifetime his name was appended to editions of the letters as their recipient, and as far as we know, he never denied the authenticity of the ascription. The question as to whether the letters were originally written in French, or whether they are a translation, hardly needs discussion here, for the principal critics, both French and Portuguese, Dora, Malherbe, Filinto Elisio, and Souza Botelho, have unanimously decided from the text itself that they are a translation, 
and a bad one. The last named says, A Portuguese, or indeed anyone knowing that language, cannot doubt but that the five letters of the nun have been translated almost literally from a Portuguese original. The construction of many of the phrases is such that, if retranslated word for word, they are found to be entirely in harmony with the genius and character of that language. But it is just this baldness for which we should all be truly thankful, because we are thus enabled to listen to what Mariana said, and hear how she said it. Had the translation been what the seventeenth century would have called a good one, we should have known Monsieur Guilherraque well enough, it is true, but only seen the nun darkly as through a glass. As to the present version, the author can only add to what he has already said in the preface, by confessing that he feels its inadequacy as much as any of his critics will doubtless do. At the same time, however, if its result be to excite competition and call forth a better one, his labor will not, he thinks, have been in vain. End of preface and introduction. Section 1 of The Letters of a Portuguese Nun by Mariana Alcoforado Translated by Edgar Prestage This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 1, First Letter She only said, My life is dreary. He cometh not, she said. She said, I'm weary, weary. I would that I were dead. Mariana Tennyson Meu amigo verdadeiro, quem me vos levou tão longe? Como vós vos fostes, tudo se tornou tristeza. Nem parece ainda, senão que estava espreitando já que vos fosseis. Bernardinho Ribeiro, Saudades, capítulo 1 Do but think, my love, how much thou wert wanting in foresight. Ah, unfortunate, thou wert betrayed, and thou didst betray me with elusive hopes. A passion on which thou didst rest, so many prospects of pleasure now only causes thee a deadly despair, which is like nothing else but the cruelty of the absence which occasions it. What? Must this absence, to which my sorrow, all ingenious though it be, cannot give a sad enough name, deprive me for ever of a sight of those eyes in which I was wont to see so much love, which made me feel so full of joy? which took the place of all else to me, and which, in a word, were all that I desired? Mine eyes, alas, have lost the only light that gave them life. Tears alone are left them. And ceaseless weeping is the sole employment I have given them, since I learned that you were bent upon a separation so unbearable to me that it must soon bring about my death. But yet it seems to me that I cling in some sort to the sorrows of which you are the sole cause. I consecrated my life to you from the moment when I first saw you, and I feel a certain pleasure in sacrificing it to you. I send you my sighs a thousand times each day. They seek you everywhere, and as sole recompense of so much disquietude, they bring me back a warning, too true, alas, of my unhappiness an unhappiness which is cruel enough to prevent me from flattering myself with hope, and which is ever calling to me. Cease, cease to wear thyself out in vain, ill-fated Mariana. Cease looking for a lover whom thou wilt never see again, who has crossed the seas to fly from thee, who is now in France, in the midst of pleasures, who is not thinking for one moment on thy sorrows, who would not thank thee for these pangs for which he feels no gratitude. But no, I cannot make up my mind to think so ill of you, and I am too much concerned that you should write yourself. I do not even wish to think that you have forgotten me. Am I not unhappy enough already without torturing myself with false suspicions? And why should I try so hard to forget all the care you took to prove your love for me? I was so enchanted with it all that I should be ungrateful indeed were I not still to love you with the same transports 
that my passion lent me when I enjoyed the pledges of your love. How can the memory of moments so sweet have become so bitter? And contrary to their nature, must they serve only to tyrannize over my heart? Alas, poor heart, your last letter brought it into a strange state. It endured such strong pangs that it seemed to be trying to tear itself from me, to go and seek for you. I was so overcome by all these violent emotions that I was beside myself for more than three hours. It was as though I refused to come back to a life which I feel bound to lose for you, since I cannot preserve it for you. In spite of myself, however, I became myself again. I flattered myself with the feeling that I was dying of love, and besides, I was well pleased at the thought of being no longer obliged to see my heart torn by grief at your absence. Ever since those first symptoms, I have suffered much from ill health, but can I ever be well again until I see you? And yet, I am bearing it without a murmur since it comes from you. What? Is this the reward you give me for loving you so tenderly? But it matters not. I am resolved to adore you all my life, and to care for no one else. And I tell you that you too will do well to love no other. Could you ever content yourself with a love colder than mine? You will perhaps find more beauty elsewhere. Yet you told me once that I was very beautiful. But you will never find so much love, and all the rest is nothing. Do not fill any more of your letters with trifles, and do not write and tell me again to remember you. I cannot forget you, and as little do I forget the hope you gave me that you would come and spend some time with me. Alas, why are you not willing to pass your whole life at my side? Could I leave this unhappy cloister, I should not await in Portugal the fulfillment of your promises. I should go fearlessly over the whole world seeking you, following you, and loving you. I dare not flatter myself that this can be. I do not care to feed a hope that would certainly give me some pleasure, while I wish to feel nothing but sorrow. Yet, I confess the chance of writing to you, which my brother gave me, suddenly aroused in me a certain feeling of joy, and checked for a time the despair in which I live. I conjure you to tell me why you set yourself to bewitch me as you did, when you well knew that you would have to forsake me. Why were you so bent on making me unhappy? Why did you not leave me at peace in my cloister? Had I done you any wrong? But I ask your pardon. I am not accusing you. I am not in a state to think of vengeance, and I only blame the harshness of my fate. It seems to me that in separating us, it has done us all the harm that we could fear from it. It will not succeed in separating our hearts, for love, more powerful than it, has united them forever. If you take any interest in my lot, write to me often. I shall deserve your taking some pains to let me know the state of your heart and fortune. Above all, come and see me. Goodbye. I cannot make up my mind to part from this letter. It will fall into your hands. Would I might have the same happiness. Ah, how foolish I am. I know so well that this is impossible. Goodbye. I can no more. Goodbye. Love me always, and make me suffer still more. End of the first letter. Section 2 of The Letters of a Portuguese Nun by Mariana Alcoforado, translated by Edgar Prestige. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 2. Second letter. Das tristezas não se pode contar nada ordenadamente, porque desordenadamente acontecem elas. Bernardin Ribeiro, Saudades, Capítulo 1 Your lieutenant has just told me that a storm has forced you to put into port in the Algarve. I'm afraid you have suffered much on the sea, and so much has this fear absorbed me that I have thought no more on all my troubles. Do you think, perchance, that your lieutenant takes more interest in what happens to you than I do? If not, why then is he better informed of it? And then, why have you not written to me? I'm unlucky indeed, if you have found no time for writing since you left, and still more so if you could have written and would not. 
your injustice and ingratitude are too great. But I should be in despair if they were to cause you any harm. I had rather you should remain unpunished than that they should avenge me. I withstand all the proofs which ought to persuade me that you do not love me at all, and I feel much more disposed to yield myself blindly to my passion than to the reasons you give me to complain of your neglect. What mortification you would have spared me if in the days when I first saw you your conduct had been as cold as it has seemed to me for some time now? But who would not have been deceived by such ardor as you then showed, and who would not have thought it sincere? How hard it is to make up one's mind to doubt for any time the sincerity of those one loves. I see clearly that the least excuse is good enough for you, and without your troubling to make it to me, my love for you serves you so faithfully that I cannot consent to find you guilty, except for the sake of enjoying the infinite pleasure of declaring you guiltless myself. You overcame me by your assiduities, you kindled my passions with your transports, your tenderness fascinated me, your vows persuaded me, but it was the violence of my own love which led me away, and this, beginning at once so sweet and so happy, has left nothing behind it but tears, sighs, and a wretched death, without the possibility of my ministering any relief to myself. It is true that in loving you I enjoy the pleasure unthought of before, but this very pleasure is now costing me a sorrow which once I knew nothing of. All the emotions which you cause me run to extremes, if I had shown obstinacy in resisting your love, if I had given you any motive for anger or jealousy in order to draw you on the more, if you had detected any artifice in my conduct, if, in a word, I had wished to oppose my reason to the natural inclination I felt for you, and which you soon made me perceive, though doubtless my efforts would have been useless, you might then have punished me severely and used your power over me with some show of justice. But you seemed to me worthy of my love before you had told me that you loved me. You gave evidence of a great passion for me. I was overjoyed at it, and I gave myself up to love you to distraction. You were not blinded as I was. Why then did you let me fall into the state in which I now am? What did you want with all my raptures, which must have been very troublesome to you. You well knew that you would not stay in Portugal forever. Then why did you single me out to make me so unhappy? Doubtless you might, in this country, have found some woman more beautiful than I am, one with whom you could have enjoyed as much pleasure, since in this you only saw the grosser kind, one who would have loved you faithfully as long as you were with her whom time would have consoled for your absence, and whom you might have left without either treachery or cruelty. You act more like a tyrant bent on persecution than a lover whose only thought should be how to please. Alas, why do you treat so harshly a heart which is yours? I can see very well that you let yourself be turned against me as easily as I let myself be convinced in your favor without needing to call on all my love, and without imagining that I had done anything out of the way, I should have resisted much stronger arguments than those can be which have moved you to leave me. They would have seemed to me very weak, and none could have been strong enough to tear me from your side. But you were ready to make use of the first pretext that you found in order to get back to France. A vessel was sailing, why did you not let it sail? Your family had written to you. Surely you know all the persecutions which I have suffered from mine. Your honor obliged you to abandon me. Did I take any care of mine? You were forced to go and serve your king. If all they say of him is true, he has no need of your help and would have excused you. I should have been only too happy if we could have passed our whole lives together. But since it was fated that a cruel absence should separate us, I think I ought to be glad indeed at the thought of not having been faithless, and I would not wish to have committed such a base act 
for anything in the world. What? You, who have known the depths of my heart and affection, could you make up your mind to leave me for ever, and expose me to the dread of feeling that you only remember me in order to sacrifice me to some new passion? I well know that I love you as one distracted. Withal I do not complain of all the violence of my heart's emotions. I am accustoming myself to its tortures, and I could not live without the pleasure which I find and enjoy in loving you in the midst of a thousand sorrows. But a disgust and hatred for everything torments me constantly. I feel my family, my friends, and this convent unbearable. All I am forced to see, and everything I am obliged to do, is hateful to me. I have grown so jealous of my passion, that methinks all my actions and all my duties ought to have regard to you. Yes, I have scruples in not employing every moment of my life for you. Ah, what should I do without the extremities of hate and love which fill my heart? Could I survive that which incessantly fills my thoughts, and lead a quiet, cold life? Such a void and such a lack of feeling could never suit me. All have noticed how completely I am changed in my humor, my manners, and my person. My mother spoke to me about it, sharply at first, but afterwards more kindly. I know not what I said in reply. I think I confessed all to her. Even the strictest religious pity my condition, and are moved by a certain consideration and regard for me. Every one, in fact, is touched by my love, and you alone remain profoundly indifferent. You write me letters at once cold and full of repetitions, the paper is not half filled, and you make it quite clear that you are dying to finish them. Dona Brites has been importuning me for several days to get me to leave my room, and thinking to divert me, she took me for a walk upon the balcony, from which one sees the gates of Mertola. I went with her, but at once cruel memories assailed me, and these made me weep for the rest of the day. She brought me back to my room, and there I threw myself on the bed, and thought a thousand times on the little hope I have of ever being well again. What is done to alleviate only embitters my grief, and I find in the very remedies themselves particular reasons for fresh sorrows. It was from that spot that I often saw you pass by, with that air which charmed me so, and I was up on that balcony, on the fatal day when I began to feel the first effects of my unhappy passion. Methought you were wishing to please me, although as yet you did not know me. I persuaded myself that you singled me out among all my companions. When you passed, I thought you were pleased for me to see you better, and admire your skill and grace whilst you caracoled your horse. A sudden fright came over me when you made it go over some difficult place. In a word, I interested myself secretly in every act of yours. I felt quite sure you were not indifferent to me, and I took as meant for me all that you did. You know too well what came of all this, and although I have nothing to hide, I ought not to write to you so much about it, lest I make you more guilty than you are already, if that be possible, and lest I have to reproach myself with so many useless efforts to oblige you to be faithful. This you will never be. Can I ever hope that my letters and reproaches will have an effect on your ingratitude that my love for you and your desertion of me have not had? I know my sad fate too well. Your injustice leaves me not the slightest reason to doubt of it, and I am bound to fear the worst, since you have cast me off. Have you a charm only for me, and do not other eyes find you pleasing? I should not be annoyed, I think, were the feelings of others in some sort to justify mine, and I would wish all the women in France to find you agreeable, but none to love you, none please you. This idea is ridiculous and impossible, I well know. I have already, however, found by experience that you are incapable of a great affection, and that you could easily forget me without any help and without a fresh love obliging you to it. I would, perhaps, 
wish you to have some reasonable pretext for your desertion of me. It is true that I should then be more unhappy, but you would not be so guilty. You mean to stay in France, I perceive, without great enjoyments, maybe, but in the possession of full liberty. The fatigue of a long voyage, some punctilies of good manners, and the fear of not being able to correspond to my ardent passion keep you there. Oh, do not be afraid of me. I will be content with seeing you from time to time, and knowing only that we are in the same country. But perhaps I flatter myself, and maybe you will be more touched by the rigor and hardness of another woman than you have been by all my favors. Can it be that cruelty will inflame you more? But before engaging yourself in any great passion, think well on the excess of my sorrows, on the uncertainty of my purposes, on the contradictions in my emotions, on the extravagance of my letters, on my truthfulness, my despair, my desires, and my jealousy. Oh, you are on the way to make yourself unhappy. I conjure you to profit by my example, that at least what I am suffering for you may not be useless to you. Five or six months ago, you told me a secret which troubled me, and acknowledged only too frankly that you had once loved a lady in your own country. If it is she who prevents you from returning here, do not scruple to tell me that I may fret no more. I am borne up by some remnants of hope still, but I should be well pleased, if we can have no good result, to lose it at a blow, and myself with it. Send me her likeness, and some of her letters, and write me all she says. Perchance I shall find reasons wherewith to console myself, or it may be to afflict myself still more. I cannot remain any longer in my present state, and any change whatsoever must be to my advantage. I should also like to have the portrait of your brother and of your sister-in-law. All that concerns you is very dear to me, and I am wholly given up to what touches you in any way. I have no inclination of my own left. Sometimes, methinks, I could even submit to wait upon her whom you love. Your bad treatment and disdain have broken me down so far that at times I do not dare to think of being jealous of you for fear of displeasing you, and I go so far as to think that I should be doing the greatest wrong in the world were I to upbraid you. I am often convinced that I ought not to let you see, so madly as I do, feelings which you disown. An officer has now been waiting long for this letter. I had resolved to write it in such a way that you might receive it without annoyance, but as it is, it is too extravagant, and I must close it. Alas, I cannot bring myself to this. I seem to be speaking to you whilst I write, and you seem to be more present to me. The next letter shall neither be so long nor so troublesome. You may open and read it assured of this. It is true that I ought not to speak of a passion which displeases you, and I will not speak of it again. In a few days it will be a year since I gave myself up to you without reserve. Your love seemed to me very warm and sincere and I should never have thought that my favors would so annoy you as to oblige you to voyage five hundred leagues and expose yourself to the risk of shipwreck to escape from them. I have not deserved such treatment as this at any man's hands. You may remember my modesty, my shame, and my confusion, but you do not remember what would make you love me in spite of yourself. The officer who is to carry you this letter sends to me for the fourth time to say that he wishes to be gone. How pressing he is! Doubtless he is leaving some unhappy lady in this country. Goodbye. It costs me more to finish this letter than it costs you to quit me, perhaps forever. Goodbye. I do not dare give you a thousand names of love, nor abandon myself to all my feelings without restraint. I love you a thousand times more than my life, and a thousand times more than I think for. How dear you are to me, and yet how cruel. You do not write to me. I could not help saying this to you again, but I am beginning afresh, and the officer will be gone. What matters it? Let him go. Tis not so much for your sake that I write as for my own. I only seek some solace. 
Besides, the very length of my letter will frighten you, and you will not read it. What have I done to be so unhappy? And why have you poisoned my life? Why was I not born in some other country? Goodbye and forgive me. I dare not now pray you to love me. See to what my fate has brought me. Goodbye. End of the second letter. Section 3 of The Letters of a Portuguese Nun by Mariano Conforado, translated by Edgar Prestige. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Third letter. Que este pequeno penhor de meus longos suspiros vá ante os seus olhos. Muitas outras coisas desejo, mas esta me seria assais. Bernardin Ribeiro, Saudades, Capítulo 1. What will become of me? And what would you have me do? How far I am now from all that I had looked forward to. I hoped that you would write me from every place you passed through, and that your letters would be very long ones, that you would feed my love by the hope of seeing you again, that full trust in your fidelity would give me some sort of rest, and that I should then remain in a state bearable enough and without the extremes of sorrow. I had even thought of some poor plans of endeavouring, as far as possible, my own cure, in case I could but once assure myself that you had entirely forgotten me. The distance which you are at, certain impulses of devotion, the fear of entirely destroying the remainder of my health by so many wakeful nights and so many cares, the improbability of your return, the coldness of your love, and your last goodbyes, your unkind pretext for departure, and a thousand other reasons which are only too good and too useless seem to offer me a safe refuge if I needed one. Having indeed only myself to reckon with, I was never able to imagine myself so weak nor foresee all that I now suffer. Ha! Ah, how pitiful it is for me! I that am not able to share with you my sorrows, and must be alone in my grief. This thought is killing me, and I almost die of horror when I think that you were never really affected by all the bliss that we shared. Yes, I understand now the untruth of all your transports. You betrayed me every time you told me that your supreme delight was to be alone with me. It is to my importunities alone that I owe your warmth and passion. Deliberately and in cold blood, you formed a design to kindle my love. You only regarded my passion as your triumph, and your heart was never deeply touched. Are you not very wretched? And have you so little delicacy that you made no other use of my love but this? How, then, can it be that with such love I have not been able to make you entirely happy? It is solely for love of you that I regret the infinite pleasures you have lost. Why would you not enjoy them? Ha! Huh. If you only knew them, you would doubtless find them much greater than that of having deceived me, and you would have experienced how much happier it is and how much more poignant it is to love violently than to be loved. I know not what I am, or what I do, or what I wish for. I am torn asunder by a thousand contrary emotions. Can a more deplorable state be imagined? I love you to distraction, and therefore I spare you sufficiently not to dare to wish that the same emotions should trouble you. I should kill myself, or die of grief, without were I to be assured that you were never having any rest, that your life was as anxious and disturbed as mine, that you were weeping ceaselessly, that everything was hateful to you. I cannot bear my own sufferings. How then could I support the sorrow a thousand times more grievous which yours would give me? I cannot, on the other hand, make up my mind to wish that you should think no more of me. And to speak frankly, I am furiously jealous of all that gives you pleasure, 
and comes near to your heart and fancy in friends. I know not what I write to you. I perceive that you will only pity me, and I wish for none of your pity. I hate myself when I look back on all that I have sacrificed for you. I have lost my honor. I have exposed myself to the anger of my parents, to all the severity of the laws of this country against religious, and finally, to your ingratitude, which has seemed to me the greatest of all my evils. With all, I feel that my remorse is not real, and that I would willingly, with all my heart, have run the greatest risks for the love of you, and that I experience a sad pleasure in having risked my life and honor in your service. Ought not all that I hold most dear to be at your disposal? Ought I not to be satisfied at having employed it as I have done? Methinks I am scarcely content with my sorrows or the excess of my love, although I cannot, alas, flatter myself sufficiently to be content with you. I live unfaithful that I am. I do as much to preserve my life as to lose it. Ah, I am dying of shame. Is my despair, then, only in my letters? If I loved you, as I have told you a thousand times, should I not have been dead long ago? I have deceived you, and you may rightly complain of me. Alas, why do you not complain of me? I saw you leave. I can never hope to see you come back. And in spite of all, I yet breathe. I have deluded you. I ask your pardon, but do not grant it me. Treat me harshly. Say my love for you is too weak. Be more hard to please. Tell me that you would have me die of love for your sake. Help me thus, I conjure you, to overcome the weakness of my sex and to put an end to all my wavering in real despair. Doubtless a tragic end would force you to think of me often. My memory would become dear to you, and perhaps you would be really touched by so uncommon a death. Would not death be better than the state to which you have brought me? Goodbye. How I wish that I had never seen you. Ah, huh? I feel how false this phrase is, and I know at the very moment in which I write it that I had far rather be unhappy in my love for you than never have seen you. Willingly, and without a murmur, I consent to my evil fate, since it has not been your wish to make it happier. Goodbye. Promise me a few tender regrets if I die of grief, or at least that you will let the violence of my love give you a disgust and repulsion for everything else. This consolation will suffice me, and if I must leave you forever, I would wish not to leave you to another woman. You surely would not be so cruel as to make use of my despair to render yourself more agreeable, and to let it be seen that you have inspired the greatest passion in the world. Goodbye once again. My letters are too long, and I do not regard you sufficiently. I ask your pardon, and dare hope that you will show some indulgence to a poor mad woman who was not so, as you know, before she loved you. Goodbye. Methinks I too often speak to you of the insufferable state in which I am, yet I thank you from the bottom of my heart for the despair which you cause me, and I hate the peace which I lived in before I knew you. Goodbye. My love grows stronger each moment. Oh. What a world of things I have to tell you of. End of the third letter. Section 4 of the Letters of a Portuguese Nun by Mariano Coforado. Translated by Edgar Prestige. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fourth letter. Ai gostos fugitivos. Ai glória já acabada e consumida. Ai males tão esquivos. Como me deixais a vida. Quão cheia de pesar, quão destruída. Camões, Ode 3. Methinks I do the greatest possible wrong to the feelings of my heart in trying to make them known to you in writing. How happy should I be, could you judge of my passion by the violence of yours? But I must not compare my feelings with yours, though I cannot help telling you, much less strongly than I feel it, it is true, that you ought not to maltreat me 
as you do by a forgetfulness which thrusts me into despair, and which even for you is dishonorable. It is but fair that you should allow me to complain of the evils which I clearly foresaw when I perceived that you were resolved to forsake me. I well know that I deluded myself, thinking as I did that you would deal with me in better faith than is usually the case, because the excess of my love put me, it seemed, above all kind of suspicion, and merited more fidelity than is ordinarily met with. But your wish to deceive me overruled the justice you owe me for all that I have done for you. I should still be unhappy, even if you only loved me because I loved you, and I would wish to owe it all to your inclination alone. But so far is this from being the case that I have not received a single letter from you for the last six months. I put down all my misfortunes to the blindness with which I gave myself up to love of you. Should I not have foreseen that the end of my pleasure would come before that of my love? Could I expect you to stay all your life in Portugal and give up both country and career to think only of me? Nothing can lighten my sorrow, and the remembrance of all that I enjoyed fills me with despair. What? Are all my hopes to be utterly futile? And shall I never see you again in my room with all the ardor and passion which you once showed? But alas, I am deceiving myself, and I know too well that all the feelings that filled my head and heart were only excited in you by a few pleasures, and that they both ended at the same time. I ought then, in those moments of supreme happiness, to have called reason to my aid, to moderate the deadly excess of my delight, and to foretell to me all that I am now suffering. But I gave myself up to you entirely and I was not in a state to think of anything which would have poisoned my pleasure and prevented me from fully enjoying the pledges of your ardent love. I was too much delighted to feel that I was with you, to think that you would one day be far from me. I remember, however, having told you sometimes that you would make me unhappy, but these fears were soon dissipated and I took pleasure in sacrificing them to you, and in giving myself up to the enchantments and the faithlessness of your protests. I see clearly the remedy for all the evils which I suffer, and I should be soon rid of them if I loved you no more. But alas, what a remedy! I had rather suffer still more than forget you. Does that, alas, depend on me? I cannot reproach myself with having for a single moment wished to cease to love you. You are more to be pitied than I am, and all my sufferings are better than the cold pleasures which your French mistresses give you. I do not envy you your indifference, and you make me pity you. I defy you to forget me entirely. I flatter myself that I have put you in a state in which you can enjoy but imperfect pleasures without me and I am happier than you because I am more occupied. Some little time ago I was made portress of this convent. All who speak to me think that I am mad. I know not what I answer them. The religious must be as mad as myself to have thought me capable of taking care of anything. Oh, how I envy the good fortune of Manuel and Francisco. Why am I not always with you as they are? I would have followed you, and waited upon you with more good will, it is certain. To see you is all that I desire in this world. At least remember me, for you to remember me will content me, but I dare not make sure even of this. I use not to limit my hopes to your remembrance of me when I saw you daily, but you have taught me the necessity of submitting to all that you wish. With all, I do not repent of having adored you, I am glad that you betrayed me, and your absence, cruel though it is, and perhaps eternal, diminishes in no way the violence of my love. I wish everybody to know it. I make no mystery of it, and I pride myself on having done for you all that I did against every kind of decorum. My honor and religion 
consist but in loving you to distraction all my life through since i have begun to love you i am not telling you all this to oblige you to write to me oh do not force yourself i only wish from you what comes spontaneously and i reject all the testimonies of your love which you can control i shall find pleasure in excusing you because you will perhaps be glad not to have the trouble of writing to me and i feel deeply disposed to pardon you all your faults a french officer had the charity to talk to me of you for three hours this morning he told me that peace was made with france if this is so could you not come and see me and take me to france but i do not deserve it do as you please for my love no longer depends on the way in which you may treat me i have not been well for a single moment since you left and my only pleasure has been that of repeating your name a thousand times each day some religious who know the deplorable state into which you have plunged me often speak to me of you i leave my room where you so often used to come to see me as little as possible and i constantly look at your likeness which is to me a thousand times dearer than life itself it gives me some pleasure but also much sorrow when i consider that i shall perchance never see you again why must it be that i shall possibly never see you again have you then left me forever i am in despair your poor mariana can no more she is almost fainting while she finishes this letter good-bye good-bye have pity on me End of the fourth letter. Section five of the Letters of a Portuguese Nun by Mariano Alcoforado, translated by Edgar Prestige. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fifth letter. Estou posto sem medo a tudo que o fatal destino ordene. Pode ser que cansado, ou seja tarde ou cedo, com pena de penar-me, me despene. Camões, Canção 9 I am writing to you for the last time, and I hope to let you see, by the difference in the terms and manner of this letter, that you have at last persuaded me that you no longer love me, and that therefore I ought no longer to love you. I will send you, on the first opportunity, all that I still have of yours. Do not be afraid that I shall write to you. I will not even put your name on the packet. With all these details, I have charged Dona Beritish, whom I have accustomed to confidences very different from this. Her care will be less suspected than mine. She will take all the necessary precautions, that I may be assured that you have received the portrait and bracelets which you gave me. I wish you to know, however, that for some days I have felt as if I could burn and tear up these tokens of your love, once so dear to me. But I have revealed such weakness to your eyes that you would perhaps never have believed me capable of going to a like extremity. I wish, however, to enjoy all the pain I have experienced in separating from them and cause you some vexation at least. I confess to your shame and mine that I found myself more attached to these trifles than I should like to tell you, and I felt that I had again need of all my reasoning powers to enable me to get rid of each object in spite of my flattering myself that i care no more for you but provided with such good reasons as mine one always achieves the end one seeks i have placed them in the hands of dona british what tears this resolution cost me after a thousand different emotions and doubts which you know not of and of which I shall certainly not give you an account, I have conjured her to speak no more to me of these baubles, and never to give them back to me, even though I should beg to see them once again, and in a word, to send them you without letting me know. It is only since I have been employing all my efforts to heal myself that I have come to know the excess of my love, and I fear that I should not have dared to take it in hand had I foreseen so many difficulties in such violence. I am persuaded that I should have experienced less disagreeable emotions in loving you, ungrateful though you are, than in quitting you forever. 
I have found out that you were less dear to me than my passion, and I have had hard work to fight against it, even after your insulting behavior made you hateful to me. The pride, natural to my sex, has not helped me to resolve aught against you. Alas, I suffered your scorn, and I could have supported your hate and all the jealousy which your attachment for another woman has given me. I should have had at least some passion to combat, but your indifference is insupportable to me. Your impertinent protestations of friendship and the ridiculous civilities of your last letter convince me that you have received all those which I have written to you, that they have stirred no emotions in your heart, and yet that you have read them. Oh, ungrateful man, I am still foolish enough to be in despair at not being able to flatter myself that they have not reached you or been given into your hands. I detest your frankness. Did I ever ask you to tell me the truth sincerely? Why did you not leave me my love? You had only not to write. I did not seek to be enlightened. Am I not unhappy enough with all my inability to make the task of deceiving me difficult to you? And now, at not being able to escopate you? Know that I am convinced that you are unworthy of all my love, and that I understand all your base qualities. If, however, all that I have done for you deserves that you should pay some slight regard to the favors I ask of you, write no more to me, I beg you, and help me to forget you entirely. If you were to show, even slightly, that you had felt some grief at the reading of this letter, perchance I should believe you. Perchance also your acknowledgment and assent would vex and anger me, and all that would inflame my love afresh. Do not then take any account of my life, or you would doubtless overthrow all my plans however you entered into them. I care not to know the result of this letter, and I beg of you not to disturb the peace which I am preparing for myself. Methinks you may content yourself with the harm which you have already caused me, whatever be the intention you formed to make me miserable. Do not tear me from my state of uncertainty. I hope in time to combine with it something like peace of heart. I promise not to hate you. Indeed, I distrust any violent feelings too much to adventure that. I am persuaded that I should find it may be in this country, another lover, more faithful and handsomer. But alas, who could make me feel love? Would a passion for another man feel my thoughts? Has mine had any power over you? Have I not experienced that a tender heart never forgets him who first made it no feelings it knew not that it was capable of? I have found that all the feelings of such a heart are bound up with the idol it has created for itself, that its first impressions, its first wounds, can neither be healed nor effaced, that all the passions which offer their help and attempt to fill and content it, promise it but vainly an emotion which it never feels again, that all the pleasures which it seeks without any desire of finding them serve only to convince it that nothing is so dear as the remembrance of its sorrows. Why have you made me feel the imperfection and bitterness of an attachment which cannot endure for ever, and all the evils that result from a violent love when it is not mutual? Why is it that blind inclination and cruel fate agree as a rule in determining us in favor of those who could only love others? Even if I could hope for some diversion in a new engagement, and could find a man of good faith, I pity myself so much that I should have great scruples in putting the worst man in the world in the condition to which you have brought me. And although I may not be obliged to spare you, I could not make up my mind to avenge myself so cruelly, even though it were to depend on me by a change which I certainly do not foresee. At this very moment, I am seeking excuses for you, and I understand that a religious is not, as a rule, lovable. 
Methinks, however, if reason guided one's choice, one ought to be more attached to them than to other women. Nothing prevents their thinking constantly of their passion, and they are not turned aside by a thousand things which divert an occupied mind in the world. Surely it cannot be very pleasing to see those whom one loves ever distracted by a thousand trifles, and one must needs have but little delicacy to suffer them without being in the spirit it, to talk of nothing but assemblies, dress, and promenades. One is constantly exposed to fresh jealousies, for they are tied down to attentions, politeness, and conversations with all. Who can be assured that they find no pleasure in all these occasions, and that they always endure their husbands with extreme disgust, and never of their free will? Huh! How they ought to distrust a lover who does not render them an exact account of all, who believes easily and without disquiet what they tell him, who in unruffled trust sees them bound to all these society duties. But I do not seek to prove to you by good reasons that you ought to love me. These are very ill means, and I have made use of much better without success. Too well do I know my fate to try to rise above it. I shall be miserable all my life. Was I not so even when I saw you daily? I was dying for fear that you would not be faithful. I wished to see you every moment, and I could not. The danger you ran in entering the convent troubled me. I almost died when you were with the army. I was in despair at not being more beautiful and more worthy of you. I used to murmur against my modest rank, and I often thought that the attachment you appear to cherish for me would be hurtful to you in some way, the thought I did not love you enough. I feared the anger of my parents against you, and I was, in a word, in as lamentable a state then as now. If you had shown me any signs of affection since you left Portugal, I should have made every effort to leave it, and I would have disguised myself to go and find you. Ah, what would have become of me if you had troubled no more about me after I had arrived in France? What scandal, what trouble, what depths of shame for my family, which is so dear to me since I have ceased to love you. I quite understand, you see, that I might have been even more wretched than I am. At least for once in my life I am speaking reasonably to you. How delighted you will doubtless be at my moderation, and how pleased with me. But I wish not to know it. I have already prayed you not to write to me again, and I repeat it now. Have you never reflected on the way in which you have treated me? Have you never considered that you owe me more than anyone else in the world? I have loved you as a mad woman might. How I despised everything else. Besides, you have not acted like an honorable man. You must have had a natural aversion for me, since you have not loved me to distraction. I allowed myself to be enchanted by very mediocre qualities. What have you ever done to please me? What sacrifice have you made for me? Did you not always seek a thousand other pleasures? Did you ever give up gaming or the chase? Were you not ever the first to leave for the army? And did you not always come back the last? You exposed yourself rashly, although I had begged you to spare yourself for my sake. You never sought the means of settling down in Portugal, where you were esteemed. A single letter from your brother made you leave without a moment's hesitation. Do I not know that during the voyage you were in the best of humors? It must be confessed that I ought to hate you with a deadly hatred. Ha! Huh. I have brought down all these misfortunes on myself. I accustomed you from the first to a boundless love, and that with too much ingenuousness, while one needs to employ artifice to make oneself loved. One should seek the means of skillfully exciting it, for love of itself does not engender love. You wished me to love you, and since you had formed this design, there is nothing that you would not have done to accomplish it. You would even have made up your mind to love me, had that been necessary. But you knew that you could succeed in your enterprise without passion, and that you had no need of it. What 
treachery. Did you think that you could deceive me with impunity? If any chance brings you again to this country, I declare that I will hand you over to the vengeance of my kinsfolk. I have lived too long in an abandonment and idolatry which strikes me with horror, and feelings of remorse persecute me with unbearable severity. I feel a lively shame for the crimes which you have made me commit, and I have no more, alas, the love which prevented me from comprehending their enormity. When will this heart of mine cease to be torn? When shall I be freed from these cruel trammels? In spite of all, methinks I do not wish you harm, and could resolve to consent to your being happy. But how could you be so, if you had a true heart? I mean to write you another letter, to show you that I shall perchance be more at peace some day. What pleasure I shall find in being able to reproach you for your injustice, when I am no longer so vividly touched by it, in letting you know that I despise you, and that I can speak with indifference of your deceit, that I have forgotten all my pleasures and all my sorrows, and that I only remember you when I wish to do so. I recognize that you have a great advantage over me, and that you have inspired in me a love which has upset my reason. But at the same time, you should take little credit to yourself for it. I was young. I was trustful. I had been shut up in this convent since my childhood. I had only seen people whom I did not care for. I had never heard the praises which you constantly gave me. I thought I owed you the charms and the beauty which you found in me, and which you were the first to make me perceive. I heard you well talked of. Everyone spoke in your favor. You did all that was necessary to awaken love in me, but I have at last returned to myself from this enchantment. You yourself helped me greatly, and I confess that I had much need of it. When I return you your letters, I shall take care to keep the last two which you wrote me, and I shall reread them more often than I have the previous ones, in order that I may not relapse into my former weakness. Ah, huh. how dear they cost me, and how happy I should have been if you had allowed me to love you always. I well know that I am still a little too much taken up with my reproaches and your faithlessness. But remember that I have promised myself a state of greater peace, and that I shall reach it, or take some desperate resolve against myself, which you will learn without great displeasure. But I wish no more of you, and I am foolish to repeat the same thing so often. I must leave you, and think no more on you. I even think that I shall not write to you again. Am I under any obligation to render you an exact account of all I do? End of the fifth letter. Section 6 of the Letters of a Portuguese Nun by Mariano Coforado, translated by Edgar Prestige. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 6 Love Letters from a Nun to a Cavalier Letter 1 Oh, the unhappy joys which love contains! How short the pleasures, and how long the pains! Cursed be the treacherous hopes that drew me on, and made me fondly to my ruin run. What I, the blessing of my life designed, is now become the torment of my mind, a torment which is equally as great as is his absence that doth it create. Heavens, must this absence then for ever last, this absence which does all my comfort blast? Must I no more enjoy the pleasing light that charmed my heart with rapture and delight? Must I no more those lovely eyes behold which have so oft their master's passion told? Nor was I wanting in the same intent. A thousand times my eyes in flesh is sent the dictates of my heart and shewed you what they meant. But now they must be other ways employed. When I reflect on what I have enjoyed, tears of their own accord in streams will flow to think I'm scorned and laughed by faithless you. And yet, and yet my passion does so far exceed a vulgar flame that I with pleasure bleed 
and dote upon the torments which from you proceed. From the first moment I beheld your face, to you I dedicated all my days. Your eyes at first an easy conquest gained, which since they have but too too well maintained. Your name each hour I constantly repeat. But what, alas, the comfort which I meet? Not but my wretched fate's too true advice, which whispers to me in such words as these. Ah, Marianne, why dost hope in vain to see thy lovely fugitive again? The dear, false, cruel man's forever gone, and thou, unhappy thou, art left alone. Gone is the tyrant, slighting all thy charms, and longs to languish in another's arms. In vain you weep, in vain you sigh and mourn, for he will never, never more return. To fly from thee he left his downy ease, and scorned the dangers of the raging seas. In France dissolved in pleasures now he lies, and for new beauties every moment dies. The joys which once he with such ardor sought are now, alas, all vanished and forgot, nor art thou ever present in his thought. But hold, my passion hurries me too far, and makes me think you falser than you are. You've, sure, more honor than to use me so, for what I have endured and done for you. Forget me, tis impossible you should. Nay, I believe you cannot, if you would. My case is bad enough without that curse, I need not find fresh plagues to make it worse. And when I think with how much care you strove to let me see at first your dawning love, when I reflect upon the bliss it brought, the pleasure is too great to be forgot. And I should think I were ungrateful grown should I not love you, though by you undone. Yet, oh, the memory of my former joys so hearts my fate my present ease destroys. Tis strange that what gave such delight before should serve to make me now lament the more. A thousand passions not to be expressed, your letters raised in my distracted breast. My vanquished senses from their office fled, a long time stupid on the ground I laid, and since I've often wished I had been dead. But I, unhappily, revived again, to suffer greater torment, greater pain, a thousand evils I each day endure, which nothing but a sight of you can cure. Yet I submit, without repining to, because the ills I bear proceed from you. And tis because you know the power you have, you use me thus, and make me such a slave. Oh, give me leave to speak. Is this the recompense you think is due to those that sacrifice their lives for you? Yet, use me as you will, to my last breath, though loathed by you, I'll keep my plighted faith. And did you understand what pleasure lies in being constant, you would change the spies. You'll never meet with one will prove so kind, though in another you more beauty find. Yet, I can tell the time, though now tis gone, poor as it is, when mine has pleased alone. You need not bid me keep you in my mind. I'm too much of myself to that inclined. I can't forget you, nor those hopes you give of your return in Portugal to live. Could I from this unhappy cloister break, you, through the perils of the world, I'd seek. I'd follow where you went, without regret, and constantly upon your fortune wait. Think not I keep these hopes to ease my grief, or bring to my despairing soul relief. No, I'm too well acquainted with my fate, and know I'm born to be unfortunate. Yet, while I write, some glimmering hopes appear, that yield a respite to my wild despair, and some small ease afford amidst my care. Tell me, what made you press my ruin so? Why, with your craft, a harmless maid undo? Why strove to ensnare my true unguarded heart, when you were sure ere long you should depart? 
what injury had I ever done to you, to make you with such wiles my innocence pursue? But pardon me, thou charmer of my soul, for I will charge you with no crime at all. Let me hear oft from you, wherever you are, for I, methinks, should in your fortune share. But above all, I beg you, by the love which once you soar should ever constant prove, by all those vows which you so often made, when on my panting bosom you have laid, let me no longer this sad absence mourn, but bless me, bless me with your kind return. And yet, so tender am I grown, I know not how to end these lines so soon. Oh, that I could, but in their room, convey myself, thou lovely, faithless man, to thee. Fool that I am, I quite distracted grow, and talk of things impossible to do. Adieu, for I can say no more. Adieu. Love me forever, and I'll bear my fate, hard as it is, without the least regret. End of the first letter. Section 7 of the Letters of a Portuguese Nun by Mariana Alcoforado, translated by Edgar Prestage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 7. From a Nun to a Cavalier. Letter 2. Alas, it is impossible to tell the flitting pains that injured lovers feel. And if my flame, by what I write, you rate, then have I made myself unfortunate. Blessed should I be, could your own breast define the raging passion that I feel in mine. But I must ne'er enjoy that happy fate, and if I'm always doomed to bear your hate, tis base to use me at this barbarous rate. Oh, it distracts my soul when I reflect upon my slighted charms and your neglect, and twill to your honour as destructive be as tis conducive to my misery. It now is come to pass what then I feared, when you to leave me in such haste prepared. Fool as I was, to think your flame was true, true as the excessive love I bear to you, to increase my torments, all your acts incline, to make me wretched is your whole design. Nor would your passion any ease allow, if only grounded on my love for you. But I'm so far even from that poor pretense. Six months are past since you departed hence, Six tedious, melancholy months are gone, and have not been so much as thought upon. Blind with the fondness of my own desire, else might have found my joys would soon expire. How could I think that you'd contented be to leave your friends and native place for me? Alas, remembrance of my former joys adds to the number of my miseries. Will all my flattering hopes then prove in vain? Must I ne'er live to see you here again? Why may not I once more behold your charms, Once more enfold you in my longing arms? Why may not I, as heretofore, receive Those sweet, transporting joys Which none but you can give? I find the flame that set my soul on fire In you was nothing but a loose desire. I should have reasoned ere it was too late, and so prevented my approaching fate. My busy thoughts were all on you bestowed, I, for my own repose, not one allowed. So pleased was I whilst in your lovely arms, I thought myself secure from future harms. But yet, you may remember, oft I've said, you'd be the ruin of a harmless maid. But those were notions that abortive died, and I, Upon your flattering oaths relied. Could I cease loving you, I should have ease. But that's a cure far worse than the disease. And tis, alas, impossible, I find, To raise your image from my tortured mind. And it's a thing which I did ne'er design, For your condition is far worse than mine. You'd better share what my poor soul endures Than the empty joys you find in new amours. So far am I from envying your fate, i rather pity your unhappy state. I, all your false dissembling arts defy, I know I'm rooted in your memory, and am, perhaps, 
the happiest of the two, in that I now am more employed than you. They've made me keeper of the convent door, which is a place I ne'er supplied before. It is an office I ne'er thought to have had. All who discourse me think that I am mad. Our convent, too, must be as mad as I, or they might have perceived my incapacity. Oh, how I wish to be as blessed as they, who, as your servants, your commands obey. I should be proud, like one of them, to wait on you, though it were even in the meanest state. My love for you I don't at all repent. That you seduced me, I am well content. Your rigorous absence, though twill fatal prove, it lessens not the vigor of my love. My passion I to all the world proclaim, and make no secret of my raging flame. Some things I've done irregular, it's true, and gloried in them, cause they were for you. My fame, my honor, and religion are, all made subservient to the love I bear. Whilst I am writing, I have no intent that you should answer what I now have sent. For it's not yourself, I'll not receive a word you send that comes not of its own accord. If not by writing you do ease receive, so too to me shall satisfaction give. To pardon all your faults I'm much inclined, and shall be pleased to prove you're not unkind. I'm told that France has made a peace. If so, a visit here then sure you might bestow, and take me with you wheresoe'er you go that must alone at your disposal be. I fear, alas, it is too good for me. Since you first left this sad, forsaken place, I have not enjoyed a moment's health or ease. The accent of your name I cares abate, which I a thousand times a day repeat. Within our convent some there are who know, from whence the source of all my sorrows flow, who strive to ease me in this course of you. I'm constant to my chamber, which is dear to me, because you've been so often there. Your picture, as invaluable, I prize, and have it always fixed before my eyes. The counterfeit does satisfaction give, but when I think that I must never live to see the bright, the fair original, great are the horrors, great the pains I feel. Oh, how I'm wrecked and torn with endless pain! to think I never must see you here again. But why should it be possible to be that I your lovely form no more must see? Forever! Are you then forever gone? Forever must I make my fruitless moan? No, Marianne, thou wilt soon have peace. Kind death approaches. He will give thee ease. Ah, me! How fast my fainting spirits fail! Farewell, O oh pity me, thou lovely man, farewell. End of the second letter. Section 8 of the Letters of a Portuguese Nun by Mariano Coforado, translated by Edgar Prestage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 8. From a Nun to a Cavalier. Letter 3. What will become of miserable me? What will the event of my misfortunes be? How can I hold, now all my hopes retire? On them I lived, and must with them expire. Where are the cordial lines to heal my pain, to assure me I shall see you here again? Where are the letters that should bring relief, compose my soul, and mitigate my grief? Fooled with vain projects, I of late designed to strive to calm and heal my tortured mind. The slender hopes I have of seeing you, joined with the coldness of your last adieu, the improbability of your return, the many tedious restless nights I've borne, your frivolous excuses to be gone, encouraged my design and urged me on. Nor did I doubt success till, ha, ah, too soon, I found I still must love, still dote and be undone. Wretch that I am, compelled alone to bear the heavy burden which you ought to share. You're the offender, and I undergo the punishment which ought to fall on you. 
tis plain i never yet enjoyed your love since all my torments can't your pity move feigned were the transports false the vows you made and only used that i might be betrayed your whole design was to ensnare my heart then cruelly to act a tyrant's part to abuse a love like mine is highly base and cannot but redound to your disgrace who would have thought when of my love possessed twas not enough to make you ever blessed and tis for your own sake i'm troubled most when i but think upon the joys you've lost nay did you judge aright the difference soon by you perceived would be betwixt abusing and obliging me betwixt the pleasures which you might have proved of loving much and being much beloved such is the force of my excessive woe i'm quite insensible of what i do ten thousand different thoughts distract my mind my rigid fate can't be by words defined to death i love yet cannot wish that you should share the miseries i undergo to loathe to have all things odious in your sight receive no ease by day no rest by night your soul overloaded with continual cares your eyes still flowing with a flood of tears did you but suffer this my grief for you to quickly finish what my own can't do why do i write should i your pity move what good would pity do without your love i scorn it and myself with equal scorn i loathe when i reflect on what i've borne my friends have lost and reputation too have ran the hazard of our loss for you but what's much worse now i all this have done false as you are even you're ungrateful grown yet oh i cannot cannot yet repent but rather am with all my ills content i cannot grieve at what i've done for you but more for your dear sake would undergo to you would sacrifice my life and fame they're yours which you and only you can claim in short i'm vexed with everything i do nor can i think i'm kindly used by you false as i am why don't i die with shame and so convince you of my raging flame if i had loved so well as oft i've said your cruelty or this had struck me dead no all this while tis you've deluded been and have the greatest reason to complain how could i see you go and yet survive be out of hopes of your return and live i've wronged you but i hope you will forgive yet grant it not treat me severely still tell me that i've abused and used you ill be harder still to please increase my care and end my sufferings with a sure despair a fate that's tragical would doubtless be the way to endear me to your memory perhaps too you'd be touched with such a death when you reflect how i've resigned my breath to me i'm sure it would welcome be indeed and far to be preferred before the life i lead farewell i wish your eyes had never seen but ha my heart now contradicts my pen i find i'd rather live involved in harms than once to wish I ne'er had known your charms, and since you think not fit to mend my state, I'll cheerfully, though hard, embrace my fate. Adieu, but promise me, when I am dead, some pitying tears you'll o'er my ashes shed. At least, let my too sad example prove the means to hinder any other love. Twill yield some ease since i must lose your charms that you'll not revel in another's arms neither can you be so inhumane sure to make my fate assist a new amour i fear my lines are troublesome to you but you'll forgive my foolery adieu hummy methinks too often i repeat the story of my too unhappy fate yet 
Let me pay the thanks to you I owe for all the miseries I undergo. I hate the state in which I lived before. The more my cares increase, I'm pleased the more. My flame does greater every moment grow, and I have still ten thousand thousand things to say to you. End of the third letter. Section 9 of the Letters of a Portuguese Nun by Mariano Coforado Translated by Edgar Prestage This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 9 From a Nun to a Cavalier Letter 4 Ye gods, the torments that from love arise When the dear object's absent from your eyes I'm told you've been by raging tempests tossed And forced to seek some hospitable coast the sea that is the faithless lover's foe, I doubt will hardly e'er agree with you. And oh, my fears for the dangers you may meet make me my own tormenting pains forget. But is your friend then more concerned to know than I the perils that you undergo? If not, how comes it that you could afford to write to him whilst I have not a word? Why do I talk? What could I else expect but base ingratitude and cold neglect from one who, sliding all that once he swore, now seeks new beauties on a foreign shore? Yet have no its wrath, nor mayst thou be ere punished for thy treachery to me, for faithless as you are, I am still inclined not to revenge, but rather to be kind. Tis plain. I'm now the least of all your care, else you'd have some regard to my despair. But I, though racked and torn with endless pain, to one relentless as the grave complain. Yet I, fond I, regardless of my fame, still cherish and indulge this fatal flame. In vain my reason offers to persuade. I scorn its counsel and contemn its aid and find a pleasure in my being mad. Had you but with this coldness been possessed, when first you raised those tumults in my breast, how many plagues had it from me detained? How calm, how easy had I now remained! But where's the woman would not have believed your arts, and not have been like me deceived? Who could your numerous oaths and vows mistrust? Who could have thought that you should prove unjust? The frequent protestations that you made Would have a heart more firm than mine betrayed. Tis hard to think the man whom once we love Should false, should cruel and ingrateful prove. Nay, I'm so easy, I've already made excuses for you, And would fain persuade my too, too credulous heart That I am not betrayed. It was your converse that at first refined my ignorance, and till then unpolished mind. T'was from your passion that I caught this flame, that is destructive to my ease and fame. In vain against you I strove my heart to arm, for you in every action had a charm. Your pleasing humor and the oaths you swore made me believe you ever would adore. But now, alas, those grateful thoughts are fled, and all my hopes are with my pleasures dead. I sigh and weep, a thousand plagues possess my soul, and give me not a moment's ease. Great were my past delights, I must confess, excessive were the joys, and vast the bliss. But then, O oh cruel fate, my miseries were not less. Had I with artifice e'er drawn you on, and what I most desired have seemed to shun. Had I the cunning arts of women used, and with faint scorn your generous love abused, had I my growing flame with care suppressed, when first I felt it rising in my breast, nay, when I found I loved, had I concealed my passion, nor to you my soul revealed, that for your hate had been some small pretense, which you might now have urged in your defense. But so far was I from using such deceit, my heart was never conscious of a cheat. 
and I no sooner of your passion knew, but frankly I returned the like to you. Yet you, though I was fondly blind, could see, not ignorant what the consequence would be. Why with such wiles then did you draw me on, to leave me wretched, hopeless, and undone? You knew you should not long continue here, and so did make me love but to despair. Why was I singled out alone to be the unhappy object of your cruelty? Sure in this country you might those have met who were for your cross purposes more fit, such who by frequent use had got the power to give their hearts but for the present hour, who of your falsehood never would complain, nor give themselves for you a moment's pain. It's like a lover then to use me so, me, would give up all I have for you? Is it not rather like a tyrant done to ruin and destroy what is your own? Had you but loved so truly as you said, you never from me in such haste had fled. But you, how easy did you go away! Nay, in seem pleased you could no longer stay. The few excuses that you made to go, how slight they were! But anything would do to fly from one already nauseous groan that loved you but too well and trusted you too soon. My friends, you cry, and honor call me hence, and I must now be gone to serve my prince. Why wasn't that nice honor thought on then, when you deluded me to give up mine? This was all fiction which you did devise to seem less guilty and to blind my eyes. But ah, uh, should I have too much bliss enjoyed, might I with you have lived, with you have died. My only comfort is, I've been to you, spite of this absence, constant, just, and true. And can you then, who all my thoughts control, and know the earnest secrets of my soul, can you be so regardless of my prayer, to abandon me forever to despair? You see, I'm mad, but yet I'll not complain, for I'm so used to suffer your disdain that now I find a pleasure in my pain. But what's my greatest curse? Those things no more can please me now, which I have liked before. My friends, relations, and my convents too are odious all, and all detested grow. Nay, everything that not relates to you the flitting hours of each succeeding day, if not on you bestowed, I think they're thrown away. So great's my love, and with such power does rule, it takes up the whole business of my soul. Why then to expel this passion should I strive? For tis impossible I should survive this restless state and with indifference live. So much I now am changed from what I was, that all observe and wonder what's the cause. My mother chides and urges me to tell what this creates my grief and what I ail. I hardly know what answers I have made, but I believe that I have all betrayed. The most severe and hardest hearts relent and are with pity touched at my complaint. To cruel thee alone I sigh in vain, for all the world beside compassionates my pain. To sell them that you write, and when you do, your lukewarmness each line does plainly show. Tis all but repetition and constraint, dull is each word and each expression faint. My kind companion took me t'other day to the balcony that looks towards Merdola. The sight so struck my heart that while I stood, straight from my eyes a briny deluge flewed. I then returned and strove to ease my care for all my thoughts brought nothing but despair. What others do to help me in my grief adds only to my pains and brings me no relief. From that balcony I often took the light to see you pass and languished for the sight. T'was there, that fatal day, I chanced to be, when first my heart resigned its liberty. T'was there I drew the poison from your eyes, Twas there this raging passion had its rise. Methought on me alone you seemed to gaze, 
and careless looked on every other face. And when you stopped, I fondly thought to me, "'Twas meant that I your lovely shape might see. I called to mind what trembling seized my breast, Caused by a leap given by your prancing beast. I near concerned in all your action was, Flattered myself I was of some the cause. What followed, to relate, I'll now forbear, Lest you appear more cruel than you are. And will perhaps your vanity increase, To find my labors have no more success. Fool as I am, to think to move you more, By threats, than all my love could do before. Too well, alas, I know my fate to come, And you're too, too unjust, to make me doubt my doom. Since I am not allowed your love to share, All ills in nature I have cause to fear. I should be pleased, did all our sex admire, Your charms, if you did not return the fire. But there's no fear, I by experience know, None ever long will be adored by you. You'll easily enough forget my charms, Without the taking others to your arms. By heavens, I love, I dote to that degree, That since I find you're ever lost to me, I wish you had some excuse to hide your crime, That to the world you might less guilty seem. Tis true, t'would make my case but so much worse, But then t'would advantageous be to yours. While you are free, in France, perhaps the fear of not returning love for love may keep you there. But mind not that. If you I sometimes see, I shall contented with my fortune be, to know one country holds my love and me. Why, with vain hopes, do I my reason blind? To one less doting you may prove more kind. Pride in another may a conquest gain, greater than mine, with all the endless pain of constant love which I have endured for you. But, oh, from me take warning what you do. Retract your heart, or yet it is too late, And think upon my too, too wretched fate. Reflect upon my endless miseries, The spares, distractions, and my jealousies. Think on the trust that I've reposed in you, The extravagance which all my letters shew. I will remember you in earnest said, For one in France you once a passion had. If she's the reason why you don't return, be free, and let me thus no longer mourn. For if my hopes and wishes are but vain, tell me the truth, and end at once my wretched life in pain. To me her picture and her letters send, they'll make me worse, or else my fate amend. Such is the state of miserable me, that any change would advantageous be. Your brothers and your sisters send me too. All will be dear to me, that so to you. Methinks I could submit to wait upon The happy woman that your heart has won. So humble am I made by all your scorn, And the ill usage that from you have borne. Scarce dare I say, I may myself allow To jealous be without displeasing you. Fain would I think that I mistaken am and fain persuaded be that you are not to blame. The person that's to bear these lines to you wants to be gone, and does impatient grow. I thought in this not to have given offence, but yet I'm fallen into extravagance. And now methinks tis time that I had done, but I've no power to end these lines so soon, nor force the pleasing vision from my sight, my lovely charmers present while I write. Twelve solitary months are almost past, Since in your trembling arms you held me last, And fondly to my ruin me embraced. Fierce and true as mine I thought your flame, And oh, believed t'would always be the same. Ne'er could I think that when you had enjoyed My favors, with them you'd so soon be cloyed, or that the dangers of the sea you'd run, Scorn rocks and pirates too, That you might shun a maid That loved like me, And is by you undone. Reflect, thou faithless man, And call to mind 
what I've endured for you, yet not repined. And tell me, can this treatment then be kind? The officer now presses me to've done my letter, or he says he must be gone. He's as impatient as if he, like you, were running from another mistress too. Farewell. From me you parted with more ease, perhaps for ever too, than I can do with these. My mind a thousand pleasing notions frames, and I could call you many tender names. More dear than is my life to me are you, and dearer far than I imagined too. Should never any yet so cruel proved to be so barbarous and so well beloved. Tis hard to end. See, I begin anew. And the officer won't stay. Oh, let him go. I write to entertain myself, not you. And tis so long, you'll never read it through. Gods, how have I deserved such plagues as these? And why was you picked out to spoil my peace? Oh, why was I not born where I might pass in innocence and happiness my days? Tis too, too much to bear. No tongue can tell what I endure. Farewell, false man, farewell. See, see how miserable I'm made by you when I dare not so much as ask your love. Adieu. End of the fourth letter. Section 10 of the Letters of a Portuguese Nun by Mariano Coforado, translated by Edgar Prestage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 10. From a Nun to a Cavalier. Letter 5. I hope, by the different air of this, you'll find that as I've changed my style, I've changed my mind. The substance of these lines will let you know that you're to take them from my last adieu, for since your love is past redemption gone, I've no pretense to justify my own. All that I have of yours shall be conveyed to you, without so much as mention made of your loathed name. The packet shall not bear those letters which I now detest to hear. In Dona Breaches I can well confide, and whom, you know, have other ways employed. Your pictures she will, and all that's yours, remove, those once endearing pledges of your love. A thousand times I've had a strong desire to tear and throw them in the flaming fire. But I'm a fool too easy in my pain, in such a generous rage can't entertain. Would but the story of my cares create the like to you, methinks, twould mine abate. Your trifles, I must own, went near my heart. With them I found it difficult to part. To what was yours I bore such mortal love, Though you yourself did quite indifferent prove. They've cost me many a sigh and many a tear, And more distraction than you e'er shall hear. My friend, I say, now keeps them in her power, And I am never to behold them more. She them will secretly to you convey, Without my knowledge hasten them away. Though, for a sight, I on my knees should lie, the more I pray, she must the more deny. Ne'er had I known the fury of my flame, had I not tried my passion to reclaim. Nay, to attempt a cure I'd ne'er begun, could I foreseen the hazards I must run. For sure I am, I could, with greater ease, support your scorn, as rigorous as it is, rather than to retain the dreadful thought that absence must for ever be my lot. I should be happy if I could be proud, and with the nature of our sex endowed, could I despise you and your actions scorn, and be revenged for all the ills I've borne. Fool as I am, to let my hopes rely on one who strives to increase my misery. You talk of truth and sincerity. They both are what you never show to me. To tell you what I've borne, Tis now too late, for the most obliged, and yet the most and great. Let it suffice I all your falsehood know, and all I ask for what I've done for you, is, write no more, but some invention find to tear your image from my tortured mind. I too must now forbear to write to you, lest a relapse should by that means ensue. And the event of this I've no desire to know, 
Methinks you should enough contented be with bills you have already brought on me. Sure now you need no more molest my ease or shake the structure of my future peace. Do you but leave me in uncertainty? I hope in time I shall let quiet be. Tis not impossible, but I may find a love as true as you have been unkind. But what will love that any man shall show afford to me without I love him too? Why should his amorous passion more incline to move my heart than yours was moved by mine? And I perceive by what I now endure that the first wounds of love admits no cure. All sorts of remedies then prove in vain. We're never recovered to ourselves again. So fixed and so immutable is fate, we're doomed to love, though we are repaid with hate. I'm sure I could not so hard-hearted be to treat another as you've treated me, provided you was to another changed. Of you I could not that way take revenge. I'd fain persuade myself a nun should never confine the passions of a cavalier. But if a man would by his reason move, a mistress in a convent is most fit for love. Those in the world do all their thoughts employ, on balls, on visits, and their finery, increase their husbands' jealousies and cares, whilst those who favor us have no such fears. Alas, we have nothing here to change desire, but by reflection daily fend the fire. I would not have you think that I maintain these arguments in hopes I may regain your love. Too well I know my destiny. I always was, and still must, wretched be, when you was here, I did no rest in joy, present for fear of infidelity, when distance, absence did my ease destroy. I always trembled while you was with me, lest you should be found and come to injury, while in the field both lives in danger were, fear of my parents did increase my care, so that, tis plain, even at the best, my mind was as disturbed as I at present find. Since you left me, had you but one seemed kind, I should have followed and not been confined. Alas, what would have then become of me to have brought a scandal on my family, to have lost my parents and my honor too, and after all to be despised by you? What thoughts soever you of me retain, I reconjure you never to write again. Methinks you should sometimes reflect upon the base and generous injuries you've done. No woman sure did e'er so easy prove. What did you ever do to gain my love? You was the first that to the army went, to stay the longest there, the best content. Did you more careful of your person grow, although upon my knees I begged you would do so? Did you ever strive to fix in Portugal? a place where you was well beloved of all? Your brother's letter hurried you away. On the receipt of it, you'd not a moment stay, and I'm informed you ne'er was pleased more than when on board a making from our shore. You can't deny, but you deserve my hate, and I may thank myself for all my fate. I was too free, and gave my heart too soon, and brought upon myself the ills I've undergone. Alas! From love alone love ne'er will rise, it must be raised by skill and artifice. Your first design was to ensnare my love, and nothing would have spared that might successful prove. Nay, I believe, if it had needful been, rather than fail, you would have loved again. But you found easier ways to work upon, and thought it best to let the love alone. Perfidious man, which way can you atone? for the bays and treacherous affronts you've done. The blinding passion now is vanquished quite, that kept the foulness of them from my sight. Must my tormented soul never have ease? When shall I be, thou cruel man, at peace? Within a while you yet perhaps may hear or have a letter from your injured fair, to let you know that she is at repose, freed of the torments that from you arose. Oh, what a pleasure it will be to me, without concern to accuse you of your treachery, and have forgotten the wrecking pains of born, 
and able am to talk of you with scorn? You had the better, it is plainly proved, because I you have out of reason loved, but by the conquest you small honor won, for I was young and easily undone. I, whilst a child, was cloistered, knew no hurt, discoursed with none but of the vulgar sort, and what belonged to flattery never knew, till I unhappily was taught by you. You the good character of every one, which you made use of to entice me on. My indignation, and your falsehood too, makes me at present much disordered grow. But I assure you, I will shortly find some means or other for to ease my mind. Perhaps may take away to quit my care, which, when tis acted, you'll be pleased to hear. Fool as I am, to say this o'er and o'er, the same that I've so often said before, of you a thought I must not entertain, and fancy, too, I ne'er shall write again. For what occasions there that I to you should be accountable for all I do? End of the fifth letter. End of the Letters of a Portuguese Nun by Mariana Alcoforado. Translated by Edgar Prestage.